all right, let's move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, that would be Ron McNaughton. Um, he'll talk to us about comets, uh, travelers from the edge of the solar system and beyond. Take it away, Ron. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to start with showing some pictures. Um, Haley had a good approach. Uh, Comet Halley had a good approach in 1910, but 1986, uh, it wasn't that good. It was more on the other side of the solar system. Um, not sure how they tracked this in those days because I certainly didn't have computers. Um, my favorite comet to observe was Yakutaki. And it was discovered, uh, the uh, symbol for the comet shows the date it was discovered, 1996. And the B stands for the second half of January. And a C or a D comet is for February and so on, but they leave I out. Anyway, several things are amazing about it. Uh, one is um, the tail probably extended about half the sky. It was just incredible how long it was because this comet came particularly close. Um, the other thing is I looked at the, um, uh, around the nucleus uh, through my telescope and I actually could see the comet moving compared to the stars. And that was such a magical thing. Uh, the only other time I've seen movement like that in my own eyes is uh, during an eclipse when the moon finally covers uh, our sun. Um, Hale-Bopp was discovered a year earlier, but was visible a year later. And I could see it on Highway 400 with uh, all sorts of cars driving in the other direction with their headlights. Um, something interesting about it, uh, it was a massive comet. And when I looked at it under high power, I could see a pinwheel pattern. And I think it would make interesting science to monitor the pinwheel patterns because um, uh, it would give rotation rates and everything uh, if it comes from jets. And I looked at this comet um, just before it, it reached perihelion. Um, it was glowing in the sunset. Um, and typically comets, when they go past perihelion, often the hemisphere that couldn't see them now could see them. And the poor people in Australia and New Zealand had to look at this absolutely stunning view with the sturation patterns of the different. And I wonder if the jets that uh, come from comets cause that, but this is so beautiful. And actually, I'm not sure how many things are more beautiful than a great comet. They're just so uh, stunning to me. Okay, I'm going to go through um, what a comet's made out of, how it forms, then the orbits that they take, and then talk about comets from beyond. Um, the nucleus is darker than fresh asphalt, and that was found on the first when, uh, uh, spacecraft that went by uh, Comet Halley. Um, the shape of the nucleus is irregular. Stardust mission um, it went through the tail of comet uh, 81P Wild, and it had this aerogel, and it caught some uh, little grains of whatever it was in the comet, and then eventually it landed in uh, um, uh, Utah in the States, and they analyzed it. And they found little crystals like this that had grown um, sort of like um, uh, frost on windows just grows in a sometimes a pattern, sometimes a regularity. And one of the surprises is it had calcium aluminum inclusions and they are also found in meteorites and they're the oldest solid things in the solar system uh, with radioactive dating. And it's four and a half uh, billion years. And when the age of the sun is given us that, it comes from that experiment. Anyway, they only form in a hot place and comets form in cold places. So it's something to uh, try and understand. Deep impact implies something hit it. And this video shows a multi-kilogram chunk of copper hitting a comet. And they learned all sorts of things about what was in it and the textures underneath. And one of the comments was it was soft as a snowbank, but I think that's underneath. And there was less water and more dust and organic chemicals than expected. Um, lots of comets have jets uh, like hale Bob did. And when it rotates, you get patterns if you're looking from the right direction. Rosetta, in some ways, is the most interesting mission. The um, European uh, Space uh, Association um, 
uh, sent this and it took about 10 years for it to get various gravity boosts from different bodies and eventually it uh, arrived in August 2014. Um, this comet had a pair of date or date that is closest of August 13th, 2015, it's about a six and a half year uh, period. It's tilted about seven degrees to the solar system and it's difficult to get to a comet that isn't in the solar system. It takes more energy to uh, go above or below. Anyway, Rosetta arrived and they spent uh, a few months to do general survey work and plan where they were going to land Philae. And this was an amazing device that could drill into the comet and do all sorts of tests of what chemicals were present. Um, they had some uh, rockets on the top, maybe that's not the right word, but the idea is just when it lands, these would go off to push it against the surface. They didn't want it to bounce. And they also had a device to trigger um, harpoons to go into the comet to hold it in place because there's very little gravity there and unfortunately the rocket didn't work and I'm not quite sure what happened to the harpoons but it bounced all over the place and ended up in some crevasse with very little sunlight and they got good science for a few days on the battery to send a radio signal to the main um, uh, uh, Rosetta spacecraft, but they missed all sorts of great research and learning they could have had about it. I don't know if there's going to be another mission like that because uh, it's too bad that happened. So um, comets have been described several things, dirty small balls, they're less confident in that, icy dirt balls uh, maybe, uh, mineral organices, um, they're different ways but uh, you've got some uh, black material, carbonaceous uh, material on the outside and inside there are all sorts of cavities because the density is a little over half of water ice and uh, there must be all sorts of openings under that because it formed. Um, uh, I love making comets and you basically buy some dry ice, maybe a little more than two kilograms and let it sit for a day because that softens it. You pound it with a mallet to break it into little pieces, mix it with water while wearing uh, insulating gloves and mix it with mud and other stuff. And there's a little bit of ethanol on comets and um, some people get the alcohol from other sources, but I have a brown bottle that uh, has it, but I don't want to put too much in. And I'm hoping to uh, open some of those brown bottles in the bar uh, sometime when we actually have real meetings. I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, this is what the comet looks like and it's really neat to do in front of kids and I put in a plug for the school clubs that uh, I'm working on as well. If you know anybody interested in uh, running a school club, um, there's all sorts of materials available and just uh, email this and there's a website that's up now. How close is this to a real comet? Well, real comets are much blacker and they aren't as dense like this is just um it's very dense that stuff and there are all sorts of cavities inside real comets so it's close how do comets form um this is beta pictoris and we just happen to be lined up right with the plane of the solar that that solar system um, this is all sorts of dust and gas that's there forming into uh, planets and comets and stuff like that and you get in the cold outer reaches of the solar system, dust gathers and it sort of forms into irregular um, uh, chunks of matter with lots of holes in it. Um, somehow that ends up combining more and this is a uh, meteorite from Tagish Lake. And somehow that combines into larger things and it's only when you get to that size that gravity takes a significant role. And I'm not exactly sure how it forms, but I do have information on where it forms. The space around a star is hotter than further out. And inside what's called the frost line, you get rocks and metals condensing, but the hydrogen compounds like water stay vaporized. But outside that it gets colder and the uh, water condenses and uh, you get comets forming. 
our frost line is somewhere in the asteroid belt. It also depends on which compound it is. Uh, water has a different condensation temperature than, say, ammonia. <clears throat> anyway, comets form further out, but the uh, calcium aluminum intrusions that were found on the comet uh, form close to the sun. So there must have been some mixing process. And studying comets tell astronomers a lot about how solar systems form. Um, pass. I heard Don, I think it is Macholtz, I'm not sure how to say his name, talk about discovering comets. I think he had something like a dozen. And he had uh, home-built apparatus to uh, look for them. Looks like he did it in his backyard and he kept finding different comets. Talk about a labor of love. Um, comets move in an ellipse. And you can make an ellipse by getting two pins and string and you just go around and that's an ellipse. This one from Comet Wild uh, has an eccentricity of about 0.54 and that's a measure of how stretched out it is, whether it's, uh, it's round if it's eccentricity of zero and when it gets close to one you have long and narrow a, uh, ellipses. Um, this is a comet that uh, Rosetta went to and its eccentricity is a little bigger and you see it's a little wider for its uh, width. And Enki uh, is actually shown in the DDO and um, its uh, closest approach to the sun is about a third of an astronomical unit and I'm showing Earth orbit and its eccentricity is even higher so it's longer for its width uh, than the others. Now, it turns out eccentricity is also defined for other conic sections. And when E gets bigger and bigger, it gets uh, closer and closer to one, it gets a longer uh, pattern, and eventually it becomes a parabola where in theory, the comet goes forever, um, except other forces in the galaxy are gonna be there. And you can even have hyperbolic paths, and that's where eccentricity is greater than one. And what happens is a uh, comet might uh, be going so fast, it's deflected a little bit by the sun, and then it goes right back out into space. Uh, another thing about comets is the inclination, and that's just the angle from the solar system to the comet's orbit, and there are a couple other angles that I'm not going to get into. A trajectory is defined by six numbers. Perihelion distance, eccentricity, inclination, the other angles, the date when it's at perihelion. Now, I have a regret in astronomy. When uh, New Horizons visited Pluto and flew past it, it didn't visit actually, it just flew past. Uh, I went to north of Orangeville to a dark country area and I took a picture of the field that had Pluto. I couldn't go the next day, but the day after I went there again and I was able to get a picture of Pluto moving. Now, when I show this to students, they love to come up and with a pointer, they say, I think this is it and this is it. And usually about the fourth or fifth one gets it to cheers from everybody. Um, do you see this triangle of stars here? Well, there's no star below it, but the triangle here and there's a dot below it that is not later on. And if you look at this wiggly line of stars, there's no dot below it in the first picture, but there is there. So that is Pluto, and in two days, it moved from there to there. Now, my regret is I wish I'd got a third observation because my understanding is usually if you have three observations with three right ascensions for a given time and three declinations for a given time, you can calculate the orbital elements. And then you can predict where it's going to be in the future, but you can also predict where it was. And then you get into pre-covery images. And the DDO used to have a whole bunch of images taken at the Polymer Telescope. And in theory, you can go back in time and say it would have been here in that image and maybe found it. Um, the small body database has the six uh, uh, items that I mentioned. Um, 2017 K2, so the observation was at the end of May, and the first observation that somebody found was four years earlier, so this is a massive comet that's out there. 
unfortunately, it's MOID, which is an acronym for basically the closest approach to Earth, is um, uh, a whole astronomical unit. So it's not that close and we're not going to get that good a view. And it also doesn't go uh, closer than 1.8 astronomical units. So it's going to be a long way away. Um, more comments, Wild 2. Uh, this is the one that uh, 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 Stardust went through to collect. Um, its eccentricity is there. It's almost in the plane of the solar system. But Halley, um, it is tilted significantly and most of the solar system objects go around counterclockwise from north. But Halley actually goes clockwise and that's part of what Edmund Halley uh, read about that it kept moving opposite to most comets through the sky and that made him think it was the same comet that came roughly 75, six years apart and um, it led him to uh, working out the orbit. My favorite comet, Yakutaki, was so close to the Earth. So this is a three-dimensional diagram and here it is on March 25th and it was very close to the Earth and the tail was so impressive and it had a pair date on April 15th of that year. Now here's a graph of comet data that I acquired and this is eccentricity across the bottom, which is the measure of whether the orbit is round or whether it's long and thin or whether it's a parabola. And this is inclination, which is a tilt from the solar system. And I've shown a whole bunch of things. Notice that Halley is, even though it's a 76 year orbit, is very far from all the other ones that I mentioned. Now, when a comet goes near the sun, it gets hot, it gives off all sorts of dust and gas, and it loses mass. And comets survive, depending on where they are in their size, something like 100 to 1,000 orbits. Now, 1,000 times Halley's orbit is 80,000 years. That's a long time in terms of my life, but it's just an eye blink compared to the history of the solar system. So eventually the comets we see right now are going to fade away and where do the new comets come from and in the 1950s two dutch astronomers said there must be a reservoir out there and the comets get deflected inward and i just made this diagram if a not very massive comet is going like this just ahead of a heavier object asteroid planet whatever the asteroid is going to deflect it inward and then it gets closer to the sun. At the same time, the asteroid's going to be pulled a little bit out like Newton's third law, and it's going to be a little bit higher, but it depends on the relative mass. So this is how the comets get to the inner solar system. And periodic comets are ones that are about 200 year or uh, periods or less, and it includes Halley. Um, but they're roughly in the plane of the solar system and given that they're in plane of the solar system, the Dutch astronomer Kuiper said there must be a belt in the plane of the solar system and it's somewhere outside Neptune and Pluto is a member of it, along with a whole bunch of other objects out there that are being discovered. Neptune controls the Kuiper belt in many ways and Pluto's orbit is Two Pluto orbits is the same length as uh, uh, three Neptune orbits. Notice that there are a whole bunch of comets with almost eccentricity one. And eccentricity one means it's a very long and thin um, uh, ellipse, sort of like this and even more. And that means the comets come from a long way away. And another Dutch astronomer, Oort, said there must be a cloud of comets that goes a long way out from the solar system. So this is the tiny Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud goes much further out. And the comets that we see that come out of the blue like Hale-Bopp and Yakutake are often from here and something's deflected them inward. Now this is a linear scale, or sorry, a logarithmic scale. So this is one astronomical unit from the sun. Saturn is about 10. The edge of the uh, heliopause is about 100. So that's 10 times the Saturn distance. 
and that's where the solar wind is no longer strong enough to uh, push away the galactic wind. The two Voyagers are about 400 astro astronomic units away right now and fading in terms of their uh, power is getting less and less. The Oort cloud goes further out from that and uh, it's uh, what's at 1,000, 10,000, maybe 100,000 uh, astronomic un units away. But nobody, oops, sorry, nobody's actually seen anything in the Oort cloud except for the comets that come in to my knowledge. So this is all computer modeling to work out where it is, but uh, that's probably the most distant part of the solar system. And the last part is, do we get comets from other solar systems? It turns out other stars do have comets, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And if a planet crosses a star as a transit, what happens is you have a dipping and then you have a symmetrical pattern coming back again, unless some object gets in the road. But with a comet, and this is predicted and observed, you have fairly constant light and then it fades fairly quickly and then it rises slowly. Now, sometimes it's a mirror image when the comet's going the other way, but uh, you get this different pattern and a number of these have been absorbed uh, of uh, stars. Now, this goes back to the graph of comets with inclination, that's a tilt compared to the solar system, eccentricity compared to the shape, round, um, uh, parabola, uh, a, par uh, a parabola. And there are a few comets with eccentricity greater than one, and those are probably going to go out into space unless something deflects it on the way out. Now, did they come from within our, our uh, solar system or did they come from elsewhere? Who knows? It might be that these had a series of fortuitous um, passing other objects and slowly worked their way in. Who knows? But Oumuamua, um, which doesn't have a glow, so it might or may not, it's either a comet or a failed comet, um, its eccentricity is 1.2. And that's clearly such that it had to come from another star system and it was discovered by a Canadian. And the code is 1i and i is for interstellar. But they since found a real comet where it gives off um, uh, emissions and uh, a coma and, and a tail. And Comet Borisov has an eccentricity of 3.4, and it's way above everything else and clearly came from outside the solar system. There are a number of historical comets, like this one from 1665, and they estimate the eccentricity is about one, which means it came from the Oort cloud, but it could be it also came from um, outside. So we have our Kuiper belt uh, on the uh, close to Neptune, and we have the Oort cloud uh, far out, and there's a continual loss of comets from the Oort cloud and bringing in new comets from elsewhere. And, um, but so far we've found a few, but that's gonna change. Um, this is the number of non-periodic comets discovered per century. That one from 1665 would be one of those 19. And the numbers are really increasing because more people are looking for comets and observing them. But this number is going to zoom because of the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. This has multiple purposes. They can find information about dark matter, but the key is that it's, um, oh, this is the mirror. And for some reason it's solid glass well with holes in it rather than the segmented mirrors. And I hope those people didn't have coins in their pockets. But anyway, that's a, another story. Um, it's an interesting mirror because uh, 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 optical system because the light comes down, it's reflected at the secondary. Then it actually bends outward to the tertiary mirror that is a different configuration than the original one. It goes through a lens and it ends up giving a sharp, fo sharp focus over a three and a half degree field. And um, they can take a picture in something like every 15 or 20 seconds. And they take two pictures of every event to make sure that the uh, cosmic rays are ignored. Um, and this can cover the sky to mag 24 to 25 every few nights. 
and they right away look to see if there's any new object that hadn't been there before and they can find all sorts of new comets and new objects and it's going to pick out an awesome number of um, uh, more comets and um, more um, uh, visitors from other star systems. So David Levy said comets are like cats. They have tails, but they do precisely what they want. And I can't make any predictions about that comet, but there are exciting things coming. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, delivering that to us. Uh, do we have any questions for Ron, Emma? Yes, we do. We have uh, one question and a couple of comments. Um, comments first. Ellen Toppenberg says, uh, Comet West was the best for me in 1976. Hayakuta was a fine one and the first I saw move too. Uh, they said, never saw McNaught, but my friend Boley and Holland went to South Africa and it was even better than Comet West and that they're still jealous. Um, <laughs> Question coming in from Ennio Chilucci. Does the start reappearance time denote a tail? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Could you say that again, please? Does the start reappearance time denote a tail? I don't know what you mean by start reappearance time. Like when it uh, passes the sun and it comes out? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, well, Comets, by definition, give off dust and gas and whatnot, and it's the solar wind and uh, solar radiation pressure that causes the two tails. And especially when it makes a tight turn around the uh, sun, like McNaught did, um, what you end up with is um, uh, it takes a while for the tail to catch up to where the comet is now going after it goes around the sun. Uh, so uh, that would be the tail of the tail. Great. Have I have I answered his question? Uh... I believe so. Makes sense to me. Um, last one is a comment from Zapfan Zapfan, who says Planet Nine will not be able to hide. Oh, for sure. <laughs> if, if there's a planet out there. Um, and I'm surprised it hasn't been detected yet because the planet would affect the uh, orbits of all sorts of Kuiper Belt objects and they're looking for patterns of anomalous motions of that. Uh, but I think Vera Rubin will most clearly find uh, planet uh, nine or nine and a half or 10, depending on you, whether you're a Pluto lover or not. <clears throat> and uh, I think it most clearly will will discover that because it's gonna find huge numbers of Kuiper Belt objects as well as uh, comets. So that's, uh, I, I totally agree. Great, thank you so much. But before right. I'm offline, I, I just like to express appreciation for the many people behind the scenes that, um, run these uh, uh, talks and, and everything. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and I appreciate it. Yes, there sure is, Ron. Uh, thanks again uh, for presenting to us, Ron, appreciate it.